everybody. Welcome, episode 40 of the Nooner. Thank you and welcome. Appreciate you guys all being here. Appreciate the favors and the restreams already. That's nice to see that starting off early. Ben DeVolder showed up. Thanks for being here, Ben. Hey, Bill. Welcome back. Welcome back. Good to see you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the greatest basketball player who never was. This story can be a couple things for you. This story can be highly, highly motivated, or it may just crap you right the heck out. <laughs> ben DeVolder says the captain of the ship. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, somebody else. Somebody else on a different live streaming network. Dude, that's hysterical. Uh, as we all know, the good man, Michael Bonnet, is the captain is the captain. This has been a predominant theme on these Nooners. Uh, I like to wrap the Nooners up reminding everyone that your greatness don't fight it. And as I was starting today's stream, starting today's episode of the Nooner, I was thinking about this. Um, and I think that the, the main character of the story today, you got to wonder, did he fight it? Did he fight the greatness? This is interesting. It's it's it's. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna get into it though. So let me just get rolling here. Hold on. Okay, we got some music. This is episode 40 of the Nooner. I am your host. My name is David Bradley. Uh, who am I? Uh, I am a sales and marketing manager with Grant Cardone. I work from home. Uh, that is a great gig. I got started with Grant. Hey, Laura, thanks for being here. I got started with Grant in March of 2011 by winning a social media contest that Grant put on. Uh, led to me coming to work for him. Been following Grant since March of 2000, or since uh, 2003, not March per se, probably August, September ish of 2003. And uh, Grant's technology took me from barely surviving in sales to thriving in it. And so when I got an opportunity to come give to other people what I didn't get when I first started selling, I was all in. So, um, these episodes of the Nooner, it's noontime nuggets about sales, business, and or life. I want to share with you guys the things that I didn't have when I first started selling to help you become better today than you were yesterday. That's one of the slogans in our company. Uh, our VP of sales, Jared Glant, dropped that initially, but that's what we're all about is getting better, being better. Okay. So, and today's topic is very, very interesting as it relates to that, um, so what do we do at Cardone Training Technologies? In a nutshell, we increase production 15 to 30% simply by helping you find and handle missed opportunities. So if that's you, if you think you've got some opportunity out there that you're not fully capitalizing on, give me a call or shoot an email out. My email address, david at grantcardone.com or 310-777-0352. I'm happy to help any way I can. Um, and I'm always available to you as my good buddy over here, Ben DeVolder, can attest. So another thing about me is I'm the author of a book called How to Stop Smoking Without Killing Anyone. I tried numerous times to quit, could not figure it out, finally found a way to do it. Uh, and in 2002, I finally stopped smoking by not quitting. The hell's he talking about? Exactly. Check out my website, www.stopdon'tquit.com for a little bit more on that. Or you can go to Amazon and pick up a copy, How to Stop Smoking Without Killing Anyone. This is not just about cigarettes. This is about any bad habit that is slowing you down. Mm, okay. Uh, another thing for me is I'm the founder of a hashtag called Rich Man's Gym. Um, if you search Twitter or you search, uh, even if you Google it, I think, you may find some interesting stuff about home-based strength and conditioning. This is for body, mind, and spirit. You don't just exercise to look good naked. You exercise to become stronger mentally and emotionally and to exercise not just your heart, but your heart. How hard can you push? It takes heart, right? It's the 12th round. Can you stay in it? That's why you train. The 12th round is, is, is uh, metaphorical. Sales, business, life. Okay, so today I'm talking about the greatest basketball player who never was. Now, a couple days ago I was talking about uh, what makes Michael Jordan successful or Kobe and what their mindset is. Um, I was talking a little bit about that and then leveraging into something entirely different. So, But in the course of that, I started Googling things about um, 
the greatest basketball player who never was. And I found something that I thought was really, really interesting, and I landed on a website, which is right up my alley. Uh, it's called todayifoundout.com. Pretty cool. So you can visit this website, todayifoundout.com, and you can find out things you didn't know, right? And one of the things that we do in our company is unless you know what you don't know, you can't, you won't get any better. So I found this guy um, who is the greatest basketball player you've never heard of. And I'm just going to tell you a story. Now, I printed the article. I'm going to read most of it. Some of it will be verbatim. Some of it's just going to be me talking about it. And then I'm going to throw some points on at the end. Uh, while this is rolling, though, if you hear something that raises an eyebrow or gets an ear or gets a scooby head tilt, you know what I'm talking about? The, eh? Okay. I want you to tweet out to me, leave a comment. This needs. I want this to be a conversation as well about success. And being successful and what that truly means. All right. So, um, if I talk to you about the greatest basketball player ever, you who, who do you think of? Bill, you're on the UK, so you're the first one that pops into your head is going to be very interesting because basketball is probably not as big over there as it is here. And I got to tell you as well, I'm not a huge fan. I've been to some games. I've watched on TV. I'm usually the guy that tunes in towards the finals. Right, I have a huge appreciation for the sport, but um, it's not something I'd watch every weekend. UFC is my bag, baby, but um, really not a big b-ball fan. But I have a, a deep appreciation for the game and what it takes to succeed in that game and the mindsets involved. So I've read some really good books about basketball players and what they do. And uh, there's a really good book called Relentless by Tim Grover. If you haven't read that, phenomenal book. Uh, that's worth reading a few times. But So who do you think of? Right in today's day and age, we're, we'll think of Kobe, we'll think of LeBron, we'll think of Dwayne Wade, we'll think of all kinds of people. Go a little bit further back, and you got Pippen and Jordan. Right, um, you go further back than that, Larry Bird, Malone, right, Dr. J. These are household names for the most part. So if you ask Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Who the greatest basketball player he ever played against was, he tells you that would have to be the GOAT. Now, have you heard of the GOAT? So if I got anybody over there from NYC, particularly Harlem, hanging out with me today on Meerkat, have you heard of the GOAT? Who is it? Do you know who this is? So if you research this guy and you find basketball aficionados, people that are in the know about the game, uh, they will tell you that he was the greatest basketball player to never play in the NBA. So who was it? And what's his story? Because it's an interesting one, and there are a lot of life lessons in this man's story. His name, Earl Manigault. You ever heard of this guy? I hadn't, not until I stumbled on this. But apparently, greatest basketball player to never play in the NBA. He was born in 1945 in rural uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So not in the city, but out in the boonies somewhere. Uh, started out life in extreme poverty and hardship. So let me just tell you what that means. Okay? It means he was the youngest of nine kids. And by the time he was seven, his parents had basically discarded him or abandoned him because they couldn't handle all nine. So he's seven years old, totally on his own. Okay, He gets uh, sort of taken in by a woman whose name was Mary Manigault, hence his last name. The article never mentions what his real last name is. So he just assumes her identity. So you're seven years old, and you just imagine that for a second. Like, what does that do for you as a kid or to you as a kid? So he lives with Mary in a shack. That she has. She she lives in a shack, basically. No electricity, no running water, no heat, unless you're lighting a fire. Okay? And you're seven. So things start looking up for Earl, though, when Mary packs up and moves to Harlem in the hopes of providing a better life for Earl. Now, this is, he's uh, seven, eight, nine years old at this point, right? Um, he's born in 45, so where are we? We're in the early 50s. Okay, this is a there was a huge migration to Harlem from African Americans 
all over the country, and Harlem was going through a renaissance at that time. So in addition to a lot of art and music coming out of Harlem in the 50s, but there was also a really huge uh, drug problem and a lot of crime. So um, this unfortunate upbringing for Earl has a few results. Uh, very little social skills and he found it very hard to connect with other people. He also found it very difficult to uh, function well in school. But by the time he gets to fifth grade, he finds his outlet. He finds his muse. He finds his music. Basketball. And he falls in love with the game and he plays all day long, grueling, relentless, all day, practicing, practicing dunks and free throws and hook shots and all these things I don't know anything about, <laughs> but he practices and he practices and he practices and he practices because this is what he loves. And by the time he gets, um, starts playing in school and becomes a force of nature on the court, he starts becoming known, like people know who this dude is, right, Earl. And in one game, he scores 52 points while in school, okay, which was a city record at the time. And he would regularly astound crowds by dunking on opponents that were a clear foot or a clear half a foot, excuse me, half a foot taller than him. So people that were six inches taller. Now, Earl was 6'1". Now, in basketball, that's not really tall. So, and that was him in his prime. He was six foot one, and with that in mind, he was still able to perform his signature move, which is, check this out, because I can't, I'm having a hard time visualizing, and I would love to see it. So, um, leaping into the air, dunking the ball, and still having enough hang time to grab it at the bottom and dunk it again. Without holding onto the net or the rim. That's amazing. So he's a showman too, right? Who else do we know like that? Who else does crazy stuff like that, right? MJ. So this dude could leap over shorter players as long as he had a running start. So this guy, he's small. He's incredibly quick. He's got this superhuman ability to jump, to fly. Right, exactly. Bendable says, what? Exactly, right? I'm just trying to visualize that. So... He can fly, right? And he starts becoming this legend on the streets of New York. And in his teenage years, he starts hustling people like you do at pool, right? You're like, you're really good at pool and you make somebody think you're not real good and then you whoop their ass and you win a bunch of money. So he starts doing that, but in basketball. And that's how he makes his living because school ain't his thing. So he winds up playing against some, like he, he goes up against some of the Globetrotters, whooping their butt, right? He, uh, Connie Hawkins, Earl the Pearl Monroe, and then of course he starts shooting hoop with Kareem. And Kareem says this, he says, Earl and I would get together on certain Saturday mornings and play a lot of three-on-three -three basketball in the park or wherever the really good games were being played. Earl was more of a street player than I was, so he never really got the same type of mainstream recognition that I got in high school. So Kareem is a lot more technical, and Earl was a lot more street or on the fly, right? Not a lot of technicality to it, but he was really, really good. So people, Kareem says, people who knew the game knew Earl could play. So somewhere in his teenage years, he gets this nickname called the GOAT. And there's a bunch of different reasons why. Um, some say it's the GOAT is an acronym for greatest of all time, G-O-A-T, greatest of all time. But most people are saying that's actually a backronym, meaning that he got it after the fact. Um, and the real reason is that one of his teachers just couldn't pronounce his name. They called him Manny Goat versus Manigault, which is how it's correctly pronounced, Manigault. So they're calling him Manny Goat, shorten that thing, now you're the GOAT. Congratulations. So this thing sticks with him. So if, you know, at the time, if you're down in Harlem or in, in anywhere in New York, if you mention the GOAT and basketball is in the subject, people know you're talking about Earl. New York's a big town. So to have that level of recognition, that's huge. So though his skills as a player would be on reproach, like you just couldn't beat this guy, um, not real good in school, 
Uh, not very enthusiastic about that. He gets kicked out of high school in his senior year for smoking pot. Um, and from here, he goes back to South Carolina to finish his studies at a prep school, where he graduates second lowest in his class. So now, even though his grades weren't good, though, colleges started recognizing, hey, I'd like to have this kid. So he gets a lot of lucrative scholarship deals offered to him, none of which he takes. Why? He later tells people that he uh, didn't have the discipline or courage to be among the first black players to attend an all-white school. So as a result, he hooks up with a predominantly black university called Johnson C. Smith University, and he winds up with a coach who just didn't get him. And his talents then get squandered. The coach's name was Bill McCullough. And he wanted Manigault to play slow and careful, which just did not jive with a dude who can double dunk in the air. So he gets in one game, and he's like, you know what, I'm doing it my way. Forget this. Goes out there, scores uh, over 27 points, wins the game for the team. And what does the coach do? Balls him out. Hammers on him, crushes him, pushes him down. And this happens over and over and over and over again. So you know what? Eventually, Earl's like, I'm out. Forget it. I'm going back to New York. I got a girl up there. We're having a baby. It ain't worth it for me. So he drops out of school, goes back to New York, and then starts drinking. And then he starts getting into drugs. And then he gets hooked on heroin. And that becomes the focus of his life on and off the court. He says, I was, I'm frustrated because I'm out of school. I, I, I just go and get myself turned on. It's a term for shooting up. As I did heroin, I was messing with that stuff like there was no, like it was the last of it. Because I'm not bragging. I was doing so much of it, I didn't know there was any more left. $100, 500 bucks. If he had it, he'd spend it. So now he's running. He made a few attempts to get into professional basketball over the next few years, but his brief stints in prison due to drugs and stealing to pay for them, he does two terms, one in 69, one in 77, had robbed him of his prime and the man who was once untouchable on the court found himself being dominated by players that he would have been able to beat, you know, a couple years ago. So in 71, after leaving prison for the first time, Manigault manages to wean himself off heroin and then vows to use his legacy to help others. Love this part. So here's how he gets the money to do this. He rolls up on a New York City drug dealer and gets a, a loan for 10 grand to clean up a local park. Uh, where ironically, uh, Manigault was using his legendary status to convince kids to stay away from drugs. So imagine that conversation. <laughs> Give me 10 grand to undermine your business. So, but like so many others in the region, the drug dealer couldn't say no to the goat. So he agrees. And so they start this thing called the goat tournament. Uh, which would ultimately feature NBA players like Mario Eli and Bernard King. Now, I'm not a basketball guy, so I have no clue who those are, but apparently they're pretty famous. So, unfortunately, heroin is not a drug that lets you off the hook very easily. So, he finds himself back on that drug. He finds himself getting arrested again in 77 for stealing. Um... When he gets out of prison the second time, last time, thank God, he leaves New York. He's like, I can't be here. It's not good for me. He goes, he leaves New York, goes back to uh, Charleston where he stays with two of his kids and he attempts to create a better life for them. And he's scraping by. He's doing odd jobs. He's mowing lawns. He's painting houses. He's doing whatever he can do to get by. Okay. Eventually, though, he goes back to New York and restarts this goat tournament. And he also starts another tournament called the Walk Away from Drugs Tournament, which is aimed at getting kids that uh, were on drugs off and tries to prevent other kids from even starting. 
So, um, and then he also gets a job at East Harlem's LaGuardia Memorial House as a counselor for kids. Some people would tell you at this point that this man is not successful. I've got a different opinion at the end. Um, so he stays in New York until 1998, where at the age of 53, he dies. Following two heart, two failed heart operations, uh, and then he gets rejected for a transplant because of his poor health. He's 53. Okay, so this is the impact of heroin, first of all, what it does to your body. Checks you out at 53. He was a guy 20, 30 years ago who's leaping around the court like a wild man and can fly like Jordan. But by the time he's 53, his heart doesn't work anymore. So... In his return to the city, where, he, where he's still a legend, has legendary status, the New York Times decides to interview this guy, I'm talking to Earl. And there's an article called, A Fallen King Revisits His Realm. I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to look it up. But in that article, he says, for every Michael Jordan, there's an Earl Manigault. We all can't make it. Somebody has to fall. I was the one. I'm just going to read that again. Thanks for the restream, Laura. For every Michael Jordan, there's an Earl Manigault. We all can't make it. Somebody has to fall. I was the one. So, I don't know if I agree with Earl on that. No, we all can't. There's only one Michael Jordan, right? But there's also only one Earl. There's only one goat. There's only one Earl Manigault, you know? And he, had a, he made a difference. How many children's lives did he save? He basically sacrificed his own life, not knowing that he did, but he gave his life for other kids to learn and for other kids to stay clean and sober and to go for something. So what lessons did Earl teach you? What can we learn from Earl? Tomorrow on the Nooner, I'm going to talk about some things we can learn from MJ. But Earl's got lessons to teach, too. There's lessons here for all of us. And what I learned from him may be very different than what you are learning from him right now. Does that make sense? So what I think is interesting, too, is what was the catalyst for him? What was that tipping point? What was it that, that literally cut him off and, 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 and killed his spirit? What was it that took his music away, you know? Was it, was it being born in poverty so he never really had a chance? I mean, was that it? Um, is it because he grew up on the main streets in New York and he was exposed to all that crap and so it's just a natural thing that you would fall into that? Was it any lack of real leadership? I mean, what if that coach let that guy out? Right? What would have happened if that coach would have let him fly, let him play, let him just be him, Right? Instead of trying to mold him into something that he's not. What, what, what did Michelangelo say about the statue of David? He said it was already there. Just let it out. Right? So what would have happened if that coach did the same thing and just let him out? Could have been totally different. You know? Was it the drugs? Was it a combination of all of that? Right? So there's all these different things that, that factor into that. But... You know, one of the things that I saw as I'm reading through this uh, is fear. Earl was scared. I don't know at what point, what it was that happened that made him so scared. But he was, you know, two things stood out for me. He never went for it, right? He, he says, I, I didn't have the discipline or the courage to be among the first black players at an all-white school. Why? Because for every Michael Jordan, there's an Earl Manigault. We all can't make it. Somebody has to fall. I was the one. That is not something you're born with. That level of think was taught. Because think about what you wanted to be when you were two, three, four, five years old. Someone says, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would you say, man? Astronaut, second base for the Dodgers. Right? 
That was taught. Somebody taught that to Earl. But at some point, Earl made a choice to stay there, to live that way. Does that make sense? That was a choice. At some point, you go from, hey, this is bullshit to this is correct. And then you start living that. Earl chose that life for himself. And he made his decision based on some bad information that he picked up. I don't know where that came from. So the lesson for me and what I would tell you at the end of this is, hey, man, you just be very, very careful of what you listen to and what you take in from what people are telling you. There can only be one Michael Jordan. Yeah, that's right. And there's only one David Bradley. And I'm going to shine as David Bradley. I can't be Michael Jordan. Nor do I want to be. I want to be me. I'm going to be the best me I can be. Right? So, permission granted to not be so scared anymore. If that's you, find ways to overcome the fear. We can talk about that on another nooner altogether. Okay? Tomorrow we're going to talk about... What did you guys hear today that you liked? So we got the bottom end of the spectrum.